All right, David here again. And now we're going to talk about reproducibility in scientific software based research and how that's related to software development best practices. So, um, I want to start with a uh, brief mention about terminology. So, there's a lot of different terms that show up when we're talking about this topic. Um, they all the terms on this slide mean somewhat different things, but for the purposes of our discussion today, uh, it doesn't really matter. So we'll, we'll just talk about reproducibility. Sometimes we'll talk about transparency and we'll just leave it there. But one thing I do wanna note um, with this multiple terminology, there's one thing um, that is particularly changing that might be worth your knowing a little bit more about. So there's two terms, reproducible, and replicable, which have been used to define sort of different levels of reproducibility. And historically, um, different communities in our, both of which are in our general space, have used these two terms in exactly opposite ways. So that could lead to a lot of confusion. And with the increasing focus on uh, questions of reproducibility in general, uh, there was an effort to get some consensus around this. And so there is uh, now a, a consensus uh, with the term reproducible being me, uh, used to mean another team is able to obtain the same result with the author's own experimental environment, their software, their computer in principle, things like that. Whereas replicable means that another team is able to obtain a consistent set of results using a different experimental environment. And the reason that I'm talking about this is because you may see, as if you're investigating these things, you may see um, these terms used in different ways. And I wanted to make you aware. There's, like I said, the transition is taking place right now as we speak, essentially. So, so you may see some things that don't quite match up. All right, so let's start um, thinking a little bit about why reproducibility is important. Well, uh, of course, scientific research is fundamentally based on the ability to reproduce results and validate them or invalidate them. Um, and of course, this is what we generally expect in uh, peer reviewed publications and, and things like that. Um, however, some of these studies that get published are not necessarily as reproducible as we scientists would like to think that they are. So back in around 2015, uh, a group of social scientists at um, the Center for Open Science did a study where they took 100 social science studies and tried to reproduce them from the literature. Uh, and it turns out that they were only able to reproduce 40% of the results. So that means 60% of these published peer reviewed results, um, they were not successful in reproducing. And this has become, you know, more and more of a thing uh, over time. And we, we find more and more studies where um, results uh, aren't able to be reproduced. And of course, when this gets into the press, uh, general press, we have, you know, start having problems because these things become um, issues about trust of science, and that leads to uh, additional issues. And, and there are many such examples. By and large, computational science had been spared this spotlight, but now um, even computational science is increasingly being held to account. So, you know, there's one example that I um, just wanted to discuss here as um, this uh, paper Back in 2009, De Benedetti's group at Princeton did a study of the behavior using um, uh, using molecular dynamics simulation. Did a study of the behavior of pure water just above the homogeneous nucleosa nucleation temperature, and they found two possible phases: either a high density or a low density phase. And then another group came along, Chandler's group at Berkeley, uh, came along two years later uh, with a similar study, and they found only one phase. Uh, just the high density phase. So how can you reconcile these things? Um, so this was a challenge and Benedetti and his team tried to pursue this, tried to understand why these two different results uh, and, and they found it challenging. Um, there were a number of issues here. One thing is that 
in Chandler's paper in Nature, uh, he says, the LAMPS codes used in uh, these references are standard and documented and the scripts are freely available upon request. So De Benedetti uh, and, and his colleague Palmer said, send us your code. And they got no reply. For a long time, they got no reply uh, until finally they appealed to the editor of Nature who intervened with the Chandler group and got them to uh, pass along a copy of the code to Palmer and De Benedetti. And so, and that obviously took five years um, to get to that point. What Palmer found when he looked things over was that they weren't actually using the standard version of LAMPS that they had sort of implied in the paper. They had added uh, some or changed something to try to speed it up. And uh, it turns out that uh, while it did speed things up, it also introduced errors. And so it was really a bug. And when Palmer replaced that, uh, what the Berkeley, Co Berkeley group had done with a more standard approach, then he was able to reproduce the result that he got before. And ultimately, but uh, you know, the problem is this took seven years. And as the quote says, there's no way you could have reproduced the Berkeley team's algorithm, uh, what they had implemented in their code from reading the paper. So um, this is a, a very detailed um, challenge in reproducibility that took quite a long time to resolve for a number of reasons, um, which are you know, sort of fundamental to the way we do science in many respects. They're unfortunate, but I think probably most of you are not entirely surprised to, you know, to see how something like this could have happened. Another more recent example that you may have heard of. Um, so uh, there's an experimental technique called nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Uh, this generates a lot of data and there are uh, some scripts out there written in Python that have been um, just made publicly available and they're widely used to analyze NMR data. Uh, and it turns out they have been using a Pyth standard Python module called glob, which returns uh, file names matching a pattern like you when you're doing a directory listing. Um, but what they eventually discovered was that this module returned results differently depending on the operating system version. Okay, and since the order, uh, since the results depended on the order in which the files were processed, then your results suddenly depended on which operating system version you ran the uh, analysis codes on. So as I said, this was pretty widely used. This bug cast doubt on results in 150 papers. Uh, so that's a pretty big impact. It's not just you know, having to retract one paper or issue a correction for one paper. It's a lot of different people affected by this and not just the authors of the scripts uh, because it was widely used, you know, um, was considered reliable. So, um, so this is another unfortunate case. Uh, one of the questions that I asked myself about this is would a unit test have actually caught this? We've been talking about testing and uh, more testing is better. How likely is it that, that a test would have uncovered this bug? Well, if you think about it, this is different versions of operating systems, right? So you would have had, had to be testing on different versions uh, to, to make sure you were getting exactly the same results. That's not impossible. There are certainly a lot of codes out there that will do things like that. Um, it's, it's quite reasonable to try to, for especially for a widely used code, to make sure it works well on sort of all the uh, operating system versions, all the major libraries, dependencies, versions, uh, and things like that, that people might want to be using it with. But um, it's not necessarily something that, uh, that you would think of immediately. So, it may not have been um, caught easily, even if somebody was not notionally very pretty thorough in, in developing unit tests. And all this comes down to the idea that science through computing is at best as credible as the software that produces it. So let's think about the credibility of our software. Um, so let's now look at what are the uh, incentives in our community for paying attention to reproducibility. How many times have we heard a statement like this? I would love to do a better job on my software, but I need to, I need to get this paper submitted. 
or I need to complete this task for my project, or, you know, I need to do something that frankly my employer values more so I can, you know, get a raise or a promotion or something like that, get tenure. And, you know, this is, so in, in many respects, there, there are obviously um, general incentives about, you know, the papers you publish and things like that, but there's also a lot of obstacles in the way. Um, but right now there's, as I said, an increasing recognition of the importance of reproducibility in science and especially computationally based science or software based science. And so there is a, a move afoot in this community to try to change the culture, to ratchet up the attention that is paid and the expectations for uh, reproducibility in our work. It's a long term goal, cultural change is a, a hard long-term thing. It's in the early stages, but it is really picking up momentum. So let's take a look at a few things out there that um, sort of fall into some of the incentives that are being put into place to try to help motivate us to do a better job with reproducibility. Uh, one is uh, supercomputer resources. So more and more these days, uh, computational science is being done on these large uh, supercomputing systems, which you're, you're not paying for time, you're getting an allocation, but it can take uh, a great deal of work to get an allocation these days. You have to write a proposal, it has to pass the review. Uh, there may be a lot of uh, competition. You know, the, the allocation programs at, at Oak Ridge are oversubscribed by two or three times or, or maybe more these days. Um, so, you know, this is this is precious resource. It could be worth literally millions of dollars, given the cost of some of these high end high end machines. And so you don't really want to squander these precious allocation hours running simulations two or three times to be confident of the results. Uh, unfortunately, this ends up happening more than most people will admit. Um, and uh, worse yet, the answer is even if you run it two or three times could still be wrong. Um, but you know, really, you need lots of people to have confidence in the results that you're producing off of these systems and off of any, you know, numerical research. Uh, of course, you should have confidence in your results. You probably want your project lead or your boss to be confident. Certainly, your sponsor would like to see, like to be confident that you're producing good results. Uh, when it gets to publishing the paper or reviewing a, a grant proposal that's based on. Um, prior work, you know, your referees or reviewers need to have confidence in the results that you're producing. And finally, the readers of your papers. So it's really important in cases like this to think about how to build credibility in your work for both you and others uh, without necessarily repeating runs to, to get, you know, just is that result um, reproducing itself in, in a very simplistic way. There are other expectations coming in, some from the funders of our work, some from the communities in which we work, in this case, uh, for the data that we produce. Um, now uh, in pretty much every US research proposal, and I think most places around the world, you're expected to provide a data management plan. Um, this is basically um, a, a plan for how you will deal with the data that is produced in your uh, research project and um, things like keeping confidential data confident, uh, uh, confidential, but also sharing the um, data that can be shared and uh, making the results, for example, the data that sits immediately behind the graphs and the tables in your papers, making that available in a machine readable format so that others can get access to it and can utilize it uh, and build on it for their own work. And these kind of things are being assessed as part of the proposal review process. I, I think they will be over time, increasingly the, the expectations will be ratcheted up. They'll be part of the award negotiations and the conditions and, and things like that. And if people don't you know, provide good uh, data management plans and don't follow through on their data management plans, they'll find it increasingly hard to uh, get a um, research award in the future. Related to that, um, something that's come out recently are the FAIR data principles. That stands for findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. And this is a set of principles that have been laid out by uh, the community to help make data in its many forms, 
more useful and more reusable in scientific research. Uh, this has also spawned off a, a similar effort called FAIR for Research Software, FAIR for RS, which applies the FAIR principles to the software itself, in, in addition to or uh, instead of the data that it produces. So these are uh, a couple more incentives to be more public and transparent and um, careful about your data and your software and things like that, um, and to make it available for public scrutiny and public reuse. There's also uh, an increasing number of initiatives in the publishing world and conferences and things like that towards reproducibility. Supercomputing has been working on this for several years uh, and ratcheting up the requirements over time. They have uh, two appendices, appendices, which uh, one of which is now required in all paper submissions and also I think all workshop submissions. Uh, and, and this is a description of the artifacts from your uh, associated with the work in your in your paper. And uh, they have something else called artifact evaluation, which is still optional, but it's meant to um, target more boutique environments like really high end systems that are hard to sort of reproduce uh, in, in a sense. Um, those remain optional, but the requirements for these have been ratcheting up. Initially, they were optional, and then they became mandatory for main track papers in supercomputing, and then they became mandatory for um, uh, workshop papers as well as the main track papers, et cetera, et cetera. So they've been, you know, working to ratchet this up. They're not alone in this. There are other publishers and conferences that have um, reproducibility requirements. They have badging policies and things like that. Um, there's a standards committee, this NISO committee on the bottom of this slide is, is a group of publishers that set standards and they're getting together to talk about standardizing uh, badging schemes related to reproducibility so that you can easily identify where papers, uh, what, what level of reproducibility has been validated for papers and things like that. And to give you a particular example, one of the early movers in this space was the ACM Transactions on Mathematical Software Journal, and they have uh, something called Reproducible Computational Results, which get you a badge if you go through this process. When you submit a paper to the RCR process in TOMS, you get the standard reviews um, associated with publishing a paper in any journal like Tom's, but you also get an additional reviewer whose focus is purely on the replication of the results. This reviewer is not anonymous. They actually work with the authors to try to reproduce the research and uh, what's in the paper. And the um, RCR reviewer actually publishes a, a short sort of command, companion uh, article that, that is published alongside the main article about the process of reproducing the results. And this is actually a published uh, paper, in a sense, a publication for the RCR reviewer. So they get credit in a way that just a standard reviewer doesn't. Um, and the authors get the badge, which shows that their paper has met a higher level of credibility or rigor. And the journal, of course, the more badges like this they have appearing in their papers, um, they get more credibility uh, and are thought, uh, you know, perceived to have a higher degree of rigor as well. So these are the, some of the kinds of things that are happening in our community. And you'll see these in various places. And basically all these things are trying to do is trying to create a virtual cycle virtuous cycle. They're trying to, you know, they're ratcheting up the expectations for transparency and reproducibility, which drives us to do a better job with our, um, with our experimental practices, with our development practices, with sustaining our software. And, um, and it turns out that these things uh, feed on each other in a positive way. And, and that's what we're trying to achieve. So now let's spend the rest of this session talking about how to actually go about improving reproducibility in your work. I'm gonna talk about this in stages, starting with development, going through to um, conducting numerical experiments and, and analyzing and publishing the results. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a lot of different ideas. Uh, it's not my intent to say that you should be doing every single one of these things. They're meant to be a lot of different ideas that can be used, you should think about 
where your biggest challenges are with respect to reproduce, reproducibility in the process that you're using and think about how some of these things and probably other things as well might help improve that situation. And we'll see as we go along that most of these things are very much connected to better software development practices. And so um, there may be multiple positive effects from thinking about these things. So let's move ahead. First of all, during development, versioning practices are really fundamental to reproducibility. Basically versioning of your code, your documentation, and all the other artifacts involved gives you a clear way to recreate a particular version of the code and the, and the related artifacts at any given point in time. So, you know, that, there's a lot of different reasons to do that. Um, you also want to make sure that versioning information appears in the outputs of your code so that you can identify if you have, you know, just a, a standard out or um, uh, output files from your application. Be nice to be able to associate them with uh, some versioning information about what version of the code they were obtained from. So there's a lot of ways you can think about doing this. Many projects have version numbers that they identify ver releases of their code by. There's different ways to do that. You can also use automatic identifiers like a git commit hash. Um, these are, you know, these will get down to a specific commit in the git repository, but they're not always um, as meaningful in the sense that version one versus version two versus version three tells you something about the progression of the features and capabilities and performance and things like that in a way that AE57F versus 43512 um, don't really, as hashes, uh, don't tell you so much. But one important thing to think about uh, in these cases is making sure that the code you're actually using in your experiments is um, directly connected to what's in the repository. So you shouldn't be building code that's been modified for your experiments, right? Without doing a commit or something like that, some way of tracking it. Also, it's good practice to maintain your documentation and other artifacts in sync with the code. Uh, otherwise, you're going to forget or you won't make time to go back and do it. And it also helps um, by having everything consistent with your uh, in your versions that, that you can be confident that the code you're reading and the documentation that you're reading uh, are actually connected instead of one being out of date. So also during development, it's really good to build in quality into your code from the start. Uh, one common way to do that is to define and follow coding standards. And that's not just coding style, but it's also setting expectations in your team for the uh, kinds of documentation and the kinds of tests that you wanna make sure are provided when code gets committed, um, the rigor of the tests, things like that. It's a good practice to develop tests as you code while things are fresh in your mind. There's actually a practice called test-driven development, which uh, Greg talked about, which uh, actually has you write the test before you write the code and then write the uh, code to pass the test. So um, that's uh, some people consider that to be a bit extreme, but it's a, a generally a good practice to, to do the tests and the base code uh, together so that you're really working things together. Um, like documentation, it's easy to forget to go back and, and write tests later. So also thinking about testing, um, you wanna institute increasingly rigorous testing as the code becomes sort of more public or more widely used, right? So if you're writing a code that's just for your own use and, and you're gonna throw it away, Testing may not be a big deal, although you should hopefully satisfy yourself that it's correct. Um, but as you have more users and as you start publishing papers using the results of the code and things like that, you um, really should think about ramping up your testing and making sure you get more coverage and making sure the quality of the code, the quality of the test is also uh, better. Of course, testing has costs. It costs time to write the tests. It costs time to run the tests. So you always have to balance the 
um, time and effort it takes to create and run the tests against the level of risk. And this is part of why, as the code becomes more public or more widely used, the risk in some sense goes up. So those are that's a, a particular circumstance where you really want to think about ratcheting things up. Uh, and also notice that note that you can run the tests with different frequencies. So you can, you know, for example, run lesser, less expensive tests more frequently, whereas you might run more expensive tests less frequently to balance things out. Um, and as long as you know that makes a, a kind of sense for the uh, tests that you really need to have done to have confidence as you're evolving your code, that can be a useful strategy. Something else we talked about a little bit earlier today is peer code review. This is a really useful way to uh, also help improve the quality of your code. You should look at this on a per commit basis. So there are many projects where every single commit that um, is merged into the main code uh, has to be reviewed by somebody other than the author. It has to be understood and judged correct by the reviewer. Um, this can um, also be a useful way to help uh, less experienced coders sort of up their game. So you can pair uh, an experienced reviewer, an experienced coder with a less experienced coder uh, to, to help ensure that they're they understand the expectations for the project and the code quality and, and things like that. Um, and you know, if you have already an existing large code base that hasn't been reviewed, you can institute a, a plan of retrospective code review. Take some time, maybe each week, you um, look over, agree to look over a couple of routines or something like that, uh, and you will eventually work your way through the, the code base. And these are all good practices during development. Also, it's really important to understand the numerics of your code. So of course, um, much of computational science revolves around floating point numbers. And these are of course, just approximations to real numbers. So um, both uh, floating point numbers versus reals and the numerical methods that we use uh, versus you know, pure math have um, often have quirks, I'll, I'll call them. Right there's there's sort of dark corners uh, that you have to worry about, and um, for example, when you add up numbers, uh, floating point numbers, uh, the order in which you add them can make a difference in the results. Sometimes it can be a significant difference. For example, if two things nearly cancel, you get something that's very close to zero, and then you add something else, um, maybe very different. Um, some small thing might get lost in in when added to a much larger number. Uh, it's also popular these days to look at using uh, reduced precision or mixed precision computations. This is especially made popular by uh, some of the accelerators that are coming out that do that perform better with reduced precision. Uh, if you're doing things like that, it's really important to understand how those should compare with the full precision results. Um, usually the goal of these techniques is to obtain uh, the equivalent results of full precision within you know, certain error bounds. Um, and it's nice to have confidence on that. First of all, um, on paper during the development of the algorithms, make sure that is achievable. Uh, and then when you actually implement, confirm that you've actually achieved that. And it may even be useful to provide an alternative computational path through the code, which gives you the full precision results so that you can compare um, one with the other easily and directly. Um, it's also when we do um, parallel computing, there are um, effects in the floating point math due to non-determinism. So as I said, floating point calculations done in a different order can yield different results. One strategy that can help address that is to force uh, a deterministic order, serialize the computations, for example, that can be very expensive. Um, so it's not often done and not often done with um, large problems, but um, it can be a really useful capability. So that's something you might want to build into your code. If, um, if you have a lot of non-determinism and you're finding numerical issues. It's also, you know, uh, another implication of these changes, the increasing use of concurrency in our work is uh, it's harder and harder to provide bitwise reproducibility. So it's really useful to look for methods of testing and verifying your code that don't require bitwise reproducibility, look for other approaches. It's really important to know the error bounds 
uh, in your application and your algorithms and to develop tests that take into account those error bounds. Um, there's conservation rules uh, and, and things like that that apply to physical quantities that can also help you um, design tests and realize that you may want to consult a subject matter expert. These are floating point math uh, is um, something that a lot of people don't get a lot of training in. Uh, there are people who are expert in it, and so you might look to them or their publications for some help in understanding the details where they become important to your work. After development, one really important thing is to continue testing. Um, as you continue development work or as you um, use the code, you're likely to find bugs. If you fix a bug, put a test in your test suite to make sure that that bug doesn't manage to creep back in as you go along. These are called regression tests. You may have heard that term used. Um, and then keep adding more tests. So, you know, you think about the common cases and then think about the corner cases, think about uh, ways that the code could be misused, whether it's unintentional or intentional. Um, you know, somebody trying to, um, you know, take, say, you know, this code, this routine looks like it could be useful. And if I try to do this with it, will it do what I want, right? And um, so it's, it's easy for people, especially if you're a library writer, for their code to be sort of misused or abused in some sense. Should think about um, synthetic tests with synthetic data. So not everything uh, it has to be physically based necessarily, even if you're trying to simulate physical phenomena. It's also really useful to think about low cost tests that can be always on, even if they're not as stringent, if they will ca catch some errors uh, and you don't have to you know, switch all your error checking on to, in order to find things, which may slow down your calculations too much, um, that can be really useful. Uh, and also silent data corruption is a real thing in today's computers. Uh, cosmic ray, for example, or a heat upset can cause bits to flip in memory. They're not always, detected um, and you may get erroneous results out of that. So can you detect when something like that would happen when, you're, when the data in your calculation gets corrupted? Are you testing your third party dependencies? Um, so how do you know, you know if, if, you up, if a, a new version of a library you're depending on comes out, how do you know if it's okay to adopt that new version? or is it gonna do you know, what you expect it to do? Um, it's also useful to test your tests. So make sure the tests you write actually fail when they're supposed to fail. So you can inject errors in the test and make sure that works as intended. Uh, it's obviously really important to thoroughly verify the code. That's basically the practice of does your code do what you intended it to do? And you can check this, you should check this on all the platforms that are relevant to your work. So the different compilers that you or your users use, the different hardware platforms, uh, GPUs versus CPUs versus FPGAs. Try to, try to make sure all the different uh, approaches are and platforms are covered. Uh, and then test regularly, because even if your code is not changing, the system that you're running on is undoubtedly changing, right? So your computing facility has uh, operating system updates, libraries get updated, things like that. And um, you depend at some level on all kinds of things you probably aren't even aware of in the system. So you actually wanna be doing some tests just to capture uh, changes in the underlying platform that might impact the results that you're getting in your simulations. So a couple of digressions here, uh, more about testing. So um, it's really useful to think about physics or math-based testing strategies, basically using what you know or what you can construct about the model you're studying to test the implementation in the code, right? So I um, mentioned on the previous slide, synthetic operators with known properties. So constructing a matrix where you know the spectrum or you know the rank or things like that, right? In a lot of um, physical, types of simulations you have invariance principles and conservation rules that have to be uh, followed in, in correct code um, within an appropriate bound or tolerance, right? So these are not always 
it's not always possible that um, they're going to be satisfied to you know the nth decimal place, but um, to to within you know appropriate precision. And you should understand going back to one of the previous slides, you should understand what precision is appropriate. Uh, there also may be mathematical symmetries, for example, just you know symmetric matrices and things like that. If you're not imposing the symmetric structure by the construction of your algorithm, then you can check that what you get out has the appropriate symmetries. Um, another um, concept for testing that I really like and uh, want to promote is something called design by contract programming. That's basically building testing into your routines. It's meant to complement, not replace other kinds of testing. And, and basically what it does is um, uh, defines a contract between the caller and the callee for an interface. So associated with the interface to this routine, um, basically you're saying, what does that routine expect on input? What are the preconditions for the routine to work properly? Then once it gets proper inputs, what does the routine itself guarantee at completion? So there may be, uh, so there are post conditions, what, what conditions are satisfied? And there are probably some things that the routine leaves untouched, what should be, what should not be changed by the routine. So, <clears throat> You can express these contracts in various ways, but you know the basic idea is given valid inputs, routine should guarantee that the outputs are valid and the invariants are maintained. Um, and so if you can uh, test some of these things with low cost tests that you can always leave on, that's all the better. Sometimes the um, tests are too expensive. You may have to switch enforcement off, off and on. Uh, but you should be sure to do that. It's a very useful capability to have in your code. And by making the contract explicit, you're facilitating others using the routine correctly, right? So once again, going back to the library writer, if you wanna make sure somebody is using your routine and um, will have a good result with it, a good experience with it, then think about making the, um, the contract for that routine explicit. Um, and that's, it's, it's basically a form of executable documentation in some sense. There are a few languages out there which support the specification of contracts. This is something that's uh, been discussed for C++ and I think it will probably go into the C upcoming C++ 23 standard from what I've heard, um, but that's uh, something to look for, very useful. Okay, now you've mostly done with your development and you're ready to start doing some numerical experiments. And so um, you really need to think uh, very carefully about what you're going to do, uh, why, and how you're gonna do it. So if you're in a team, it's really useful to designate one person to coordinate the entire experimental campaign so that they make sure that um, all these things are carefully considered and that things don't fall through the cracks. So you need to know what you need, what's needed in the code, what's needed as inputs, what outputs do you need to capture, to analyze or whatever you need to do. How are you going to do that analysis or processing? Um, what should you expect? What, are, what roughly, what should the results look like? Even if you're doing you know, brand new discovery science, um, you should have some idea as to how to judge whether the results are reasonable or not reasonable. And you also need to know something about the performance or the cost of these simulations and also the analyses and things like that to make sure that you have enough resources and, and um, can actually do the campaign that you need to do. And finally, you should give a lot of thought to how can you convince yourself that these results are trustworthy. If you're starting to run a simulation that is larger than you've ever run before with your code or things like that, doing you know, new features and what have you, you should really think about um, doing some pilot runs to help build confidence in the correctness and making sure you understand the performance and scaling of your code so that you're confident that you can do the full simulation campaign that you're planning. And you also need to make sure that you have resources, not just to run the simulations, but also to deal with the outputs, whether you're storing them or streaming them or whatever you're doing and to actually run the analyses on them. So this is also a, a very important aspect. <clears throat> 
Um, also during the experiments, can you reproduce your code at each and every point of the experiment? Can you go back and do that three years later when somebody questions you about some um, unexplained feature in your paper? Um, some good practices there are to use only well-defined versions of the code. Going back to this idea before, make sure that the code you're running is captured in your version control repository and make sure you know exactly what version it is. Don't change versions during a series of experiments unless you really have to. Sometimes we find bugs and they may need to be changed. Uh, but in any case, try to make sure that you know which version of the code has been um, used with exactly which uh, experimental runs. Don't use versions of the code that haven't been thoroughly verified and continue to use these regular testing practices that I thought about, uh, that I talked about before to identify changes that might happen to the underlying platform. If you're spending weeks or even months on a simulation campaign, there's certainly going to be changes to the underlying system and you wanna be able to identify when those are starting to affect your results, obviously. Something that's not often done, but you can think about is trying to capture version information for the libraries and compilers and key dependencies that you're using to build your code. Um, containers um, are a little bit about this. They, they will um, help capture more the actual versions of the code, not necessarily giving you easy access to the version information, maybe not giving you access to the compiler information because that tends to be outside the uh, container and things like that. But these are things to think about depending on you know, how sensitive your code is to some of these aspects. Uh, and finally, in terms of your experiments, be thorough in capturing the provenance. You want to make sure you know all the, the codes and the inputs and outputs and the transformations that are taking place on the data. Um, capture all the inputs and configuration information for each experiment. Think also about what outputs that you can capture. You may not be able to afford to capture all of them, say in a version control system, but maybe, maybe some of them you can. And use multiple systems to document all this work and make sure that you can correctly associate the inputs, outputs, code versions, and things like that. So, you know, a lot of people will use um, directory and file naming conventions. If you do that systematically, that can be one good way, but you should have more than one way. Uh, lab notebooks are not, uh, are, are still a thing. You should um, think about having a paper or electronic notebook. Uh, they're not just for people who work in the, uh, at the experimental lab bench. They also are useful for computational scientists. You can use scripts as another form of documentation to or orchestrate your experiments. If you do that, you should version those and capture them in version control uh, as well. So there's a lot of things you can do here. And then after the experiments are done and you're continuing to do your analysis and reduction and things like that, continue to make sure you're capturing all the provenance information, script as much of your analysis or reduction as possible. If you're using a GUI based tool that requires human interaction, it's a lot harder to reproduce that from one time to the next. Once again, continue documenting your processes thoroughly, preferably multiple mechanisms as you're going along through the reduction process, capture intermediates if you can afford to. Um, and finally, when you're producing papers, uh, graphs and tables and things like that for your paper, make sure to capture the data behind them in a simple machine readable form so that you can satisfy your data management plans and an increasing number of publishers are also expecting you to make this kind of information available so people don't have to digitize your graphs or things like that. There are tools out there that can help with reproducibility. Here's a few. Um, there's probably a lot more that uh, I don't have uh, familiarity with, but really a fundamental thing about tools is make sure you understand and test the tools that you wanna use before you use them for something important. So if you're going on some big experimental campaign and it's gonna burn up your whole supercomputer allocation for the year, you know, make sure these tools as well as the code and things like that um, are behaving in the way that you think they should. So to summarize, uh, the credibility of your science derives from the credibility of your code and the processes that you use in your experimentation. We've seen uh, in recent years, a lot of the scientific stakeholders ratcheting up expectations for reproducibility and, and transparency. And there are strategies to improve these things um, throughout the scientific process that really more or less equate to better software development practices. So the same things we've been advocating for other reasons.
And finally, um, here are a few additional resources that uh, a few of which were kind of referred to during the talk and a, a few have not been, but you might find them useful. And with that, uh, we're happy to take questions about reproducibility. Thank you.